While in the West, the battle for the liberation of France and Belgium was raging, the Red Army opened an offensive on the Central Front over a thousand miles east from Normandy. By June the 29th, Vitebsk, Zlobin, Orsha, Mogilev and Babrysk were captured. Six Russian army groups were advancing on a 600-mile front from Skaf to Tarnopol. In southern Poland, the Red Army captured Lublin. In these battles, the Red Army used considerable numbers of Allied tanks which had been sent to Russia under the Lend-Lease Agreements. Once more, the prisons yielded up their victims. Polish soldiers fighting with the Soviet forces greeted their friends and families. A few miles from Lublin lay Majdanek. Remember this name, Majdanek. Here the Germans had constructed what they themselves officially called an extermination camp. Only a few survivors greeted the Red Army men from behind the barbed and electrified wire surrounding the camp. The German firm which built this place proudly displayed its advertisement. A commission of Russian, Polish and Allied observers visited Majdanek. They found six gas chambers disguised as shower baths. Zyklon, this is the gas the Germans used to kill innocent men and women by the thousand. Having killed their victims, the Germans burned them in special incinerators. But they were careful to rob them first of all valuables. Shoes, jewelry, watches, clothes. Even toys they took from the children whom they killed here. The Soviet authorities questioned the German guards. Their questions revealed that the Germans had killed here 1,380,000 men, women and children, mostly Jews and Poles. The inventory of the dreadful crimes grew and grew. With great thoroughness, the Germans had converted the ashes of some 680,000 whom they had burned into fertilizer. And all around the camp grew lovely big cabbages, white with the ashes of the dead. Remember, Majdanek, 
It's the place at the end of the road which fascism must travel. But the advance of the Red Army continued. Chemizel fell, Yaroslav and Brest-Litovsk were overrun. The Germans were totally unable to stand up to the Red Army. On the central Polish front, the Russians reached Praga, a suburb of Warsaw, on the east bank of the Vistula. From the western side of the Vistula, the Germans tried to crush underground Polish fighters who rose up against them. For 63 days, the Germans bombarded them mercilessly with heavy artillery. They used dive bombers to break the resistance of the Poles. The Red Army was unable to get through to help. There were not enough supplies to force a crossing of the Vistula after an advance of hundreds of miles. Two hundred miles further north, the Red Army cut off a large German army group in the Baltic provinces of Latvia and Estonia. All these Russian successes compelled the Germans to regroup their armies. They decided to build up a strong bastion in Estonia and another in the Warsaw area. To do this, the Germans had to withdraw some 30 divisions from the Balkans. It was not possible for them to rush in new divisions to cover their weakened positions there. They would have been able to do this, but for the Allied armies in Italy, which together with the Italian partisans were able to tie down just those 30 divisions which the Germans needed so badly. These Allied armies, made up of British, New Zealand, South African, American, Polish, Brazilian, Indian and Canadian divisions, were slowly pushing the Germans up towards the industrial north. The Germans did everything they could to delay the Allied advance by blowing up bridges and blocking the roads. What the Germans failed to do, the mud accomplished. Behind the lines, about 14 of the German divisions were continually engaged in fighting the Italian partisans, who played an important part in Field Marshal Alexander's campaign. Many of them were equipped with Allied weapons and were trained in sabotage and guerrilla warfare. The Germans used armoured trains and crack mountain troops to hunt down the Italian fighters. Everyone they killed or captured, ten took up arms against the Tedeschi. Meanwhile, having brought up fresh supplies, the Russians renewed their offensive towards the end of August on the southern front. They planned to outflank the Germans in Poland by a thousand mile circular sweep through the Balkans. First, the Red Army entered Romania. Next, the Red Army invaded Bulgaria. Further west, the Red Army went into Yugoslavia. To the north, they crossed into Hungary. 
Next, they struck towards the Ruthenian passes in the rear and on the flanks of the Germans in Poland. The plan worked very smoothly. The Red Army crossed the rivers Prut and Seref and took Yassi on the 22nd of August. The government of Romania capitulated the next day. By August the 30th, the Russians were in Plejsti. The great oil fields were now forever lost to the Germans. On September the 1st, the Russians drove into the Romanian capital, Bucharest. They had come 225 miles in nine days. In this way, the first of Germany's allies was forced out of the war. Having overrun Romania, the Soviet forces crossed the Danube into Bulgaria. Bulgaria had been an ally of Germany and had helped to police Greece and Yugoslavia. Within five hours on the 5th of September, the Bulgarian government surrendered. The second of Germany's Balkan allies was out of the war. The Red Army entered Sofia, the capital, within a few days. There were many friends waiting for them among the people, who despite all the efforts of the Germans had stubbornly refused to fight the Soviet Union. On the borders of Bulgaria and Greece, refugees were living a pitiful existence. Greek families whom the Germans had driven from their homes. The Greeks had suffered perhaps more than any other people under German occupation. There was a great welcome, therefore, for the British forces that landed near Patras in the Peloponnese. Other British forces landed in the Dodecanese and the Cyclades. And they landed at Salonika. In the dark days of their withdrawal from Salonika, on the 25th of April 1941, the British had sworn, we will come back. Soon, Athens itself was set free. There was little or no fighting. Men and women of EAM and other resistance groups had driven the Germans from their country. Fighting broke out later between EAM and Greek royalist groups, in which British troops intervened. A compromise was reached in this unhappy business with Mr. Churchill's visit to Athens and the appointment of Archbishop Damaskinos as regent. <music> Meanwhile, in the Balkans, the Red Army, by agreement with Marshal Tito, entered Yugoslavia. Marshal Tito's troops were among the most active and powerful partisan forces in Europe. They tied down a large number of divisions which the Germans needed elsewhere. Some of the Tito partisans were trained by British instructors. From the training centers in the Dalmatian Islands, they returned to the mainland to continue the fight. In conjunction with the Red Army, Tito's partisans entered Belgrade. The Marshal himself was there to salute the fighting men and women of his armies.
Hungary was one of Germany's oldest allies. For years, Hungarian fascists, under their leader Admiral Horthy, had counted on Nazi and fascist backing. But the price of Nazi support was Hungarian soldiers for the Eastern Front. Happily, these soldiers had the blessing of the Admiral. But now the Red Army was advancing through Hungary. Budapest was surrounded. To the northeast, the Russians were striking from Debrecen to take the Germans in central Poland in the rear. Horty fled to Germany, and the Germans retreated towards Austria. Another of Germany's allies was about to capitulate. On September the 20th, a new Russian offensive opened in the Baltic sector. A drive to the coast isolated a German army in Estonia. Turning west, the Red Army fought its way through Lithuania to the mouth of the river Niemen. Here, desperate German resistance blocked the Russian advance for the time being. The Red Army now consolidated its positions along the frontiers of East Prussia. The Russian advance to the shores of the Baltic Sea liberated yet another capital, Riga. This advance by the Red Army had severed land communications between Germany and Finland. The Finns were forced to conclude an armistice with the USSR and a considerable German army was cut off in Finland. The Red Army pursued the remnants of the trapped German divisions into the Arctic North and entered Norway near Kirkenes. In Norway, the Germans had set up a fascist government under Quisling. There was only a handful whom Quisling could persuade to join the SS and to sacrifice themselves in Russia for the greater glory of the German Reich. The real answer of the Norwegian people was sabotage and resistance. Thousands of young men escaped to England. Hundreds were training in Sweden. With the help of arms and wireless equipment dropped by the RAF, the Norwegian patriots were able to organize a highly effective resistance to the Germans. The Germans had turned Norway into an advance base for their U-boats and their navy. The huge German battleship Tirpitz lay in wait for Allied convoys to Russia. After many attacks, the Tirpitz was finally sunk by RAF Lancasters in Tromsø Fjord on the 12th of November. Farther south in Denmark, Popular resistance was successful largely because of the unity of the people. Against this unity, the German commander, General Lindemann, and his police troops were powerless. By means of sabotage and general strikes in June, July and August 1944, 
the Danes were able to stop the Germans from deporting workers to work in the German war factories. <laughs> 